the, first, the first topic that I want to cover is actually one covered, I think, in the previous uh, chapter, chapter 17 or possibly chapter 16. Um, but it is germane to chapter 18 and probably most chapters after this. And this issue of diagrammatic versus purely symbolic reasoning. Eugenia Chang comments in a in a sort of uh, a bit of text that I found incredibly insightful about um, why in category theory we we uh, reason symbolically uh, with diagrams. And um, I just remind us of, of some of our favorite contexts. You remember this category Hask or Haskell, where we have uh, types and functions. And within uh, programming, within software development, um, uh, there's many good arguments for making use of code that has explicit typing and, and static, strong static typing, such that errors uh, of type of that, that involve mistakes as to types can be caught easily. So you don't do something silly like uh, directly try to uh, you know take the length of a of an of an inch or find its uh, its last character or something like that, or you don't try to have a bool that takes the result of a square root operation. Um, so we we count in a lot of programming languages on types to catch a broad set of errors, and we can't catch errors perfectly, but the types help help us avoid capturing, avoid um, making some some very common. And what Eugenia Chang um, comments is by analogy to the role types play in programming. And she argues that, that you know, in circumstances where you can either choose to purely diagrammatically, uh, excuse me, purely symbolically, as of the lab, write down equations, um, uh, or where you can use diagrams. Uh, accompanying them, that there's extra context provided with the diagrams. And, you know, her point is that with the diagrams, you're explicit in noting the source object, the, the, the domain, and the code of it, the target object. So C and D respectively there, for example, for F, and then for G, you know, the Vice versa, um, B is the domain and C is the code domain. You actually depict them in context. Because you depict them in context, you can ensure that the types line up, the types make sense, right? That that there are end-to-end -end errors. The G goes from where F leaves off, right? The, the, or to put it another way, the domain of G is the same as the code domain of F. If one purely reasons in terms of the symbolic um, uh, values, you can, of course, go and try to double check that. But you have to reason through, and often you have to you know, go off and look, OK, F is from C to D, and G is from D to C. And therefore, this type checks, and you have to kind of reason it through in your head, right? Um, you have to think, OK, F first, that brings C to a D, and then G after, that brings a D to a C, and so that's going to be in type, you know, what C. Whereas, uh, in other words, you have any on C. Whereas if you use the diagram, you can, at a glance, just verify their end to end. Right? And so, you know, she argues in a way, provides that context for the symbols. You see the, the objects that serve as the Domain source and the code of the target. Uh, and as diagrams become a lot you know, bigger, larger, this ability to reason diagrammatically ends up being super helpful. And I'm going to flash some diagrams up there, which I showed in the last time I ran 898. Um, but um, uh, which you know, I'm not designed for you to understand them fully right now, but it, it kind of gives a, 
a sense of the sort of things that we reason about with diagrams. And if you look at these diagrams to the right, these are content, uh, these are common in the context of um, of monads uh, and associated with monad laws. And you can see sort of roughly corresponding text to the left, which is designed to give a sense of what this means symbolically. I wrote this out quickly, so I may have missed some things. But you can see that just you know, looking at the left and trying to parse it through and reason through um, where things come from and where they go to and what their types are, it's much more difficult than looking at something on the right. Look at something on the right, you see, okay, IDC, um, so this identity on C, uh, and then this, this is a, a ten, called a tensor, but basically it represents a, uh, here a, um, uh, a functor mapping C cross C into, into C. IDC just preserves this first C and these two here get collapsed down. But you can see it visually because you have this context, eh? Um, and, uh, and, and by the way, this is a mistake. It still says F and G there. I didn't fill it in. Um, or something like this. We've we've seen this in class before, right? This is, anyone remember what, what this is? What is this thing? This is a, it looks like a, either a one or a one. Mind, yeah, it's an epic or a monic, a monomorphism or an epimorphism. In this case, it's an epimorphism. And, you know, it says that for all objects uh, Z and, and uh, G2, G uh, you know, uh, G1 after F um, uh, equals G2 after F. And you can kind of see at a glance again, these kind of make sense. G2 comes after F, G1 comes after F. Where if you say it over here and you have to visually check it, it's, you know, you can do it. It's just more cumbersome. It's not as intuitive. It doesn't catch your attention, right? Um, uh, this is horizontal combination, uh, composition of natural transformations. You'll certainly learn, learn about this. But these are functors here, G after F. Um, uh, that's a combination of functors from one category to another. These C, D, and E are categories here. And these are functors between them, F. And natural transformations map functors to functors. And this is not designed to be something you interpret right now, but the point is trying to reason about this purely with symbols, trying to explain this to symbols is so much more difficult than looking at a diagram which says, okay, look, alpha maps F to F prime and reminds you F goes, you know, F and F prime both go from C to D. It's just like so easy to look at in parts compared to trying to reason about it symbolically and remind yourself, okay, F, okay, both of those go C to D, I guess. You're almost, in, in many cases, for someone like me, I'd want to, I'd almost want to draw something out to capture that. And, and this is what category theory um, really draws on the, this ability to, to use these diagrams uh, very powerfully to, to reason through these things. This is another example. Uh, and this is sort of taking this and mapping it out component-wise. And again, I mean, trying to do it purely symbolic would be, I think, um, a fit of madness, right? It would be a fool's errand, or at least it would be setting yourself up for so much more difficult a situation than at least diagramming it out. And I'm not saying diagramming it out is pretty, but it gives you a big light up just compared to purely working in terms of these symbolic characterizations. There's another case where we reason about like where F star is mapped to over here. This is for a, a Kleisley category for a monad. Um, and and it, it gives some understanding of kind of when we use diagrams, they can get quite, quite rich. They can get quite involved. And we need all the help the diagrams from muster because otherwise we're just groping through, you know, digging through these uh, layers of symbolic notation. We have this added context here. Uh, incidentally, this is for natural transformations 
in Haskell and in a programming context um, where we have two functors, the list functor and the maybe functor, where maybe encodes, like maybe event says, we may have an end or we might have, we might might not, we, we might have nothing. Um, that's what maybe does. Maybe a bool is we might have a bool, but we might have nothing. Um, you can imagine like, maybe you go through a big complex calculation somewhere it includes in by zero. And what you get back is a nothing. Well, it didn't give you any value. Um, it allows you to encode partial functions. These functions that um, uh, allow you to work with these cases where um, they don't always give a, a return value. Um, and then we have lists, uh, list event. And, and a functor here maps from, it's actually the same matrix from has to has. So C and D are actually the same here. But int, the type int, that object is mapped to list event. Bool is mapped to list of bool um, uh, here. And, uh, and we have also uh, maybe going on. So we have maybe event to maybe a bool. And then we have a polymorphic function, uh, poly uh, polymetric uh, uh, polymorphism, um, a parametric polymorphism applying where we have uh, a something called safe head, which can um, which can map a uh, list of an int to a maybe of uh, an int by extracting the first element here of the list if it exists. And guess what the list, get this, guess what value of maybe of int this will map to if the list is empty. You wanna guess? If we, have an, if we have a list of several elements, maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's three, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's, you know, 23,522 uh, elements in our list, uh, safe head will extract the first, okay? If it is, if it's a list of length zero, guess what it will extract? Nothing. Maybe you can encode a value, in this case, an int or nothing, okay? Um, and uh, here, what this is showing actually has great performance implications because it's saying, look, um, we can either have uh, a, uh, a lift and if, if we're interested in uh, mapping over the list is negative and taking the first one, we might as well, it's actually provably the same, which is why we reason about these things here, it's provably the same as taking the first item as a maybe int, and then just uh, applying is negative to that. And, and this is really important because if you have a list and you do an F map, you, you map over every element of this list, maybe it's 23,522 long, you map is negative. You're determining each element of this list and you get a list of pool as a result, right? Because is negative, or lifting is negative, something which asks a given int, is it positive or negative? It returns a bool. We're lifting it to operate a list. list. That's remember that functors can lift. They can remember a functor can map a morphism in the source category has to a morphism in the target category that maps from what the object maps to. So we have a morphism here from integral called is negative, right? It maps, it says whether an int is negative or not, right? That's over on the left hand side here. And this functor, the list functor, maps that to, it, it's a functor. So it maps objects to objects. It maps int to list of int, right? It maps bool to list of bool. Um, here we go. Um, and is negative, it's a morphism. What do functors map morphisms to? They map morphisms to what? To morphisms. What morphism does it map to? Well, it maps to a morphism that is the lifted value of is negative. In other words, it's an adaptation that lifts this to operate on lifts. So is negative 
It lifts it to be able to operate on lifts. So is negative maps from end to bool, and the functor maps uh, end to list of end, bool to list of bool, and it maps is negative to something that takes a list of ends and returns a list of bool. How do you think that works? How do you think? How do you think what happens when you lift a function here that goes from end to bool? To now go from list event to list of bool. How do you think it works? Anyone? I'll give you a hint. This list of bool is the same size as this list event. It, it has to be. So what is it? Every element of the list event. Exactly. You check negative or not. That's the lifted value of this function. Yeah. That's how this func the list functor works. It lifts it by applying it to every element. Mm -hmm. Um and and so what I'm saying is it's guaranteed to be the same. It's guaranteed to commute. So you can either do a lot of work, take your list, map is negative over it, get a list of bools, and then take the first element of it. Mm -hmm. Or you can take that list. Just extract the first element as a maybe, and and then a maybe event, and then map is negative over that. What do you think? Them so again, functors map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. Maybe is a functor. It maps int the type int to guess what? Maybe int. <laughs> And uh, bool to, to the maybe bool. That's right. So that's a functor. It it takes the object int and has to match it to maybe event. And bool to maybe a bool. That's a it's a functor. A lot of functors are like containers, it turns out, not all, but but, but many. Um and that functor also applies, like all functors, they map morphisms to morphisms. So it maps is negative to a lifting of this negative to maybe. How do you think is net, you told me earlier, how does this negative work for lists? And Tony exactly was correct. It applies it to every element of the list. So if you, for list functor, if you lift is negative, each element of the list events, you apply is negative to it, you get a list of bulls, right? For maybe, guess guess what you do. Remember, maybe has either has a value, so maybe event has an end, or has nothing. It it doesn't have it. Remember, we we might have had a empty list, so we we couldn't get the first element, so it is nothing. Right, so that's why it's a maybe event. Otherwise, you know, I mean, we have to signal we don't have a value, and so we we make it a maybe. It either has an end. Is extracted from the by safe head, or it has nothing as safe head indicates. Okay, so we have a maybe event. It's either an integer or it's nothing. What do you think we do with is negative? If we have an integer, what do you think we return? It's negative on the integer. And the integer. Yeah. So if we have an if we have an integer three, we ask, we get maybe a fool with guess what? We we so, so we'll call this sum of three. In other words, S O M E. It's it's a value of three in a maybe event. If we have that, we will get a maybe bool that has the value what? True. Yeah, true. It'll be sum of true. S O M E true. Um, because is negative on three is true. If if this value were minus three here. Maybe event holds minus three, sum of minus three, S O M E of minus three. What would you get? Maybe a bool would be. Oh, actually, you didn't be true. I got that, I got that first last time. Oh, did you say false? Yeah, I said, I said true last time, but it's negative one positive three should be false. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. Thank thing. you. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking it was positive. Yeah, quite right. Um, For minus three, it would be true. Yeah. Um, but then the question is, how does this lifting of that, because remember, maybe objects, objects, morphisms, morphisms. So it lifted is negative to maybe's version of is negative. It's a lifted version that operates on maybes. 
right? It, it goes from maybe a vent, the thing that in map to, to maybe a pool, the thing the pool map to. Okay. So this lifted value, this lifted morphism, how do you think it handles a nothing? What would it return? Nothing. nothing. But but the nothing returns is maybe a bool nothing, right? So it takes maybe a vent nothing and returns it maybe a bool nothing. And, and so the point of this commuting triangle is you can save a lack of work. I mean, these days, maybe we have a million elements in this list, right? Gosh, these days for big data, I mean, we might have 10 million elements in this list. We can either map is negative over every stinking one of them, every single one, 10 million, and then extract the first. Or what can we do instead? Extract the first and then ask if it's negative or not. And the point is, by the rules of functors, natural transformations, and the rules of Haskell that, that reflect them, this is guaranteed to commute. This is what's called a natural transformation. Going this way and this way down is guaranteed to be the same as this. We haven't covered this yet, but it's a bit of a glimpse of how this applies and why it matters if for some performance optimizations. The point is you can provably demonstrate that doing it this way um, is needlessly expensive and we could just extract the first and map it. We don't have to do all this work. It is provably the same because this square commutes. That's what naturality, a natural transformation guarantees. We're going to see natural transformations soon. I think it'll be in another, uh, I don't know, another um, uh, another chapter, probably two or three chapters, but before the end of the book. And so this is something that can be revealed to us by reasoning through these properties. What I wanted to show you though, is this is an aspect of diagrammatic reason. And again, if you just reason purely symbolically, like some of us like to do, say in algebra, you really bog down, you miss opportunities for intuition about what's going on. You miss opportunities for just seeing what's going on. And category theory is a very diagrammatic language. It says like, you know, both these paths can you trying to write this out symbolically without a diagram would be again a fit of metals. Okay. So that was a comment on diagrammatic reasoning. It's about why it's valuable to not only be working with these. Sometimes we need them next to our diagram. Sometimes we need them to state if this is part of a general category, we need it, we need to say that these things compose, or we could write this one as F minus one, Tony, right? Um, but <laughs> if we only were working symbolically without diagrams, we end up just, you know, doing a lot more work and potentially missing errors because we're not checking basic things that are established just by drawing it out visually. Does that make sense? And that's why diagrams are such a central part of category theory and why I feel there's such an ideal part as well of, of using, of, of serving modeling, which is about diagrams. Um, so much of it is, is, is assisted by reasoning about diagrams. Um, so category theory embraces diagrams. And as Eugene Yerchan says, that lowers, that allows us to spot errors. It allows us to reason more um, uh, with greater facility about within greater clarity about the context in which our morphisms are embedded and lets us avoid silly errors where we write down the composition of two dot of two uh, arrows that aren't even end to end like they need to be. Does that make sense? So I think writing down writing down diagrams is is um, good practice and I'd encourage you uh, to take it, uh, take it seriously. Any questions on this before I stop going to products and co-products?